Welcome to Leave No Doubt. I've been joined by Swansea captain Matt Grimes. Matt, how you doing, mate? Very good. How are you? Yeah, good. Pleasure to, to have you here, mate. I've been trying to get you on for a while, so we appreciate it. No um, worries at all. To get us started, mate, many people listening to this will know young players who were super talented uh, growing up who never really grew into their potential. The players that should have made it but didn't and that people expected big things from. Um, when you were 19 years old, the Exeter manager, Paul Tisdale, publicly said that you were the best young player he had ever seen at the football club. Obviously, a, and a football club that was renowned for producing young players. We've just spoken about it before uh, press and record. There's a lot of young players who come through Exeter who, who are obviously super talented. What do you think it was about you that meant you were able to, to deal with the expectation people had on you to become a great player and fulfil those expectations? Um, well, what a question to start. <laughs> uh, I think it's difficult uh, for any young lad coming through, um, especially especially these days. Obviously, everyone everyone coming through wants to wants to be in the first team and, and wants to make it. But I feel like back then, when you're younger, you you kind of don't really take it all in. I feel like as you get older and as you experience more, you kind of you almost think about things more. So when you're a young lad, all you want to do is play football. So 18, 19, whatever I was when I was coming through. All I wanted to do was be on the pitch. So I'm watching I'm watching first team games at 14, 15, thinking like I want that to be me in, in a couple of years' time. Um so then obviously when when you get your chance, you're just so focused on taking I'll i speak for myself because I was just so focused on taking it. You kind of you kind of just think, right, I've had a good game there, I'll I'll stay in the team for the next one. Right. Another good game, stay in the team, stay in the team. And then before you know it, you're kind of like 10, 15, 20, 30 games in and and you're still in the team, you're still playing. Obviously, you, you might come out for a couple, but I think it's important and I, I certainly didn't really think too much about it. I think if you are if you have the pressure of, wow, I, I, he says I'm a good player, I, I, that means I, I have to be good. Like I think it, it can have a negative effect. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, Probably just not thinking about it too much, just thinking one game at a time, taking it, taking it as you go. So when you must have obviously left school 16, gone into Exeter's youth team and, and become full-time training. Yeah. What was it that you, that you were doing, do you think, in that two-year period of, of your sort of your scholarship that allowed you to, when you were 18, be ready to, to go into a first-team environment and, and do so well? Um, to be honest, I, I don't think I really did too much different to, to any other lads. Um in my in my first year as a scholar, you kind of just learning learning how it goes and learning how um, how things work and, and getting used to training every day. So that that went went by in a flash, and you're just kind of picking up from the older lads what you can and and, and drawing on their experiences if you like. Um, and then the second year in my scholar, I actually had a little bit of a wobble. Um, I I, th- I feel like at the start of the second year, I kind of thought about being a pro too much. And I've kind of thought, right, I'm I'm good enough. I'm uh, I'll be a pro, like no problem. And I remember we played Plymouth away in the uh, in the Youth Cup, lost three nil, and I was awful, like so bad. Probably one of the worst games I've ever had as a as a footballer. And I got home, mum and dad absolutely grilled me, like so so bad. So from then it was a bit a bit of a wake up call um, to like this is the only chance you're going to get. Like you have to, you have to do everything right. You have to live like a pro now, so then you're you're ready to to transition into it. And, and like I say, I, d- I don't think I really did too much different to to many of the other lads. Um, I would probably say I was just not more focused. I think that's unfair. Um, but football was like the only thing that that I wanted, so I just carried on. Like I say, day to day, need to train well today, need to play well next game, and then just carried it through. What do you think the difference then, uh, you just mentioned there having a wobble uh, as a second year youth team player and I sort of can relate to what you say is in two years as a, as a scholar is a long period of time and to be super focused all the time and to be bang on it in training every day and obviously and we're talking this podcast and, and we'll almost talk the perfect game but that, it doesn't necessarily exist so what do you think the difference was between you having a wobble and then after that after you know the conversation with your parents what, what was the difference between the two versions of you? Um, well, the big difference was I think it was just realization. Like I think once you become a scholar, you've got two years then of of training full time before you potentially get get made a pro. 
Um, so you get like a taste of what being a pro is like. You, you're playing football every day. All your mates are at college and and not hating it, but thinking, oh, I wish I could be doing what you're doing. So you're kind of like, well, I'm doing all right here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, and then I felt like it happened to me at the right time because if it, I was another three, four months down the line, then I don't think I'd have been able to change it before then having my pro decision, if that makes sense. I, I felt like I, I realised at a good time. Some some people don't. Some people just think, oh, I'll get, not, I'll get a pro, but I'm living a great life. Um, the decision at the end of it like, is what it is. If I get taken on, brilliant. If I don't, then then I don't. And I felt like I was so focused until that couple of months and then it needed that to to snap me back to to reality, and then and then carry on as if I was for the since I was nine years old. There's a lot uh, a lot of guys that I speak to on on here actually talk about having negative experiences and and that working out for them. I think the difference that I find with a lot of the top top guys, and and obviously you are now uh, have been for a long period of time, you know, and a, a top elite player is those negative experiences you have end up becoming positives or, or those feelings that you have ended up pushing you towards, you know, better things. Uh, and the guys that sort of slip away use those negative experiences and, and they sort of, it, it finishes them in, in a way. When you look back on that time, do you think that was obviously like a, a big turning point in, in what ended up obviously in a successful? Yeah, I think, I think obviously I didn't see it at the time, but looking back, I feel like you only really take stock like years down the line and, and I've I've been having this conversation a few a few times recently with like friends, family, but in football you need like a slice of luck. And when that luck comes, it I think it shows itself in so many different ways. But it depends how you see that, like how how you take it going forward. Because if if that happened to me, I've I've had a terrible game, mum and dad have had a go at me, and I just think, oh, like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about, like, no worries, and just carried on how I was, then I wouldn't be a professional footballer. So I think it's those moments that you have to draw on. And like I say, what what set me apart from the rest, I feel like football is, is without sounding bad, very, very negative. The, the more you play, the more you realise, the more negative things happen to you than positive. There is more negative moments in your career than positive. So how you deal with the negativity, how you not bounce back, but how you take it in and use it as a positive, the the easier it becomes. Yeah, I totally agree. That's very wise for, for a young guy. Obviously, there's a lot of guys in football, especially the guys at the top, everybody thinks that their life has been perfect and that their whole journey is, has had no bumps in the road, but that's, you know, that's no. not true, is it? No, it doesn't happen. It, it, well, unless you're Messi or Ronaldo... I don't think there's, and even if you sat down and spoke with them, I guarantee that they would tell you negative things that have made them better. But I really don't think any footballer has just come into the team, played, got a move, played, done well, and it's all positive. Like, it just doesn't happen. I think, again, I've touched on it, it defines sort of the best guys from, from the guys who end up coming out of the game is, is the guys who can manage to deal with those experiences and, and kick on. But if taking that, you know your own advice eventually when these things that you know that I first talked about that the manager's saying you're the, one of the best young players he's ever seen at the club when things like that get said about you um after you've been you know you've had those experiences of maybe feeling slightly comfortable where where you were what does feedback like that do for you like what what did that do for you at the time do you know what i, I, I be honest i struggle to remember i i remember him saying and and coming out in the press and saying that and I was kind of like taken aback a little bit, thinking, wow, like that's such a good thing to say. But again, like I feel like if you take in negative comments, if you take in positive comments and let it affect you emotionally too much, I feel like that can have a detrimental effect, especially something like that. You think, wow, he said that, like I have to be the best. I have I have to be the best in training. I have to be the best in the game. And like that just lumps on so much pressure onto a player. So as well as it is like such an amazing thing that, that you said that, such a positive thing, you have to just remain level the whole, the whole way through. And I felt like I did that quite well. I, I don't really remember taking it in and taking it too much to heart. Yeah, that's quite good. I, th I think a lot of guys, when they're young, obviously look out for 
what people are saying them on on social media when when guys make debuts they're desperate to know what fans yeah, think of them yeah. and I, you know I can relate to that because yeah. as, as a young guy I was similar I was desperate to know do people like you do they not like you yeah. remember I've told a story a couple of times on this podcast of thinking I've played well and coming home and my mum telling me oh somebody online thought you were rubbish and and you know it really sort of affected me it was it, had, it was my uh, Premier League debut for um, for Swansea. And I remember coming home, obviously it should be an unbelievable achievement. I come home, like, yeah. I thought, no, it was my first Premier League start, Crystal Palace away, drew nil-nil. So it was like a decent result. I've had a good game. I played 90 minutes. So like the manager must have thought, I've done all right. Come home, like, oh yeah, like buzzing, buzzing with it. And my mum turns around to me and goes, not what they're saying online. And I just remember thinking like, oh, Oh, is it not? Like, and it does, it does, everyone wants to be liked. Like, you you can't ever say, oh, I don't, I don't care what he says. I don't care what they say. Everyone wants to be liked. It's human nature. But you need to accept the opinions of those that matter and forget about the ones that don't. How old were you when, when you realised that? I would probably say about 25, 24, 25. Is when I, when... I was first made captain, I think. That was that was the toughest period for me. That you really accepted different opinions and... Yeah, yeah. Because everyone's going to have an opinion on you. As a footballer playing at any level, someone somewhere is going to have an opinion on you. It's just, it's just how it is. Um, but I was told to never accept an opinion from someone you wouldn't ask advice from. So... That's good advice. That that writes off quite a few people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you were obviously so, when you were at Exeter and you obviously were excelling, and I can imagine not only Swansea were were in to try and sign you, and don't know what that's like as a young player. I didn't experience that where you, you know where you play so well that, that a lot of people are interested in you and stuff. How were you able to to deal with that? Um, after my first summer, I did not deal with it well at all. It was it was in the papers every week. This this team's interested. That team's interested. I'm on the phone to my. I'm 19 years old. Or no, I was 18 at the time. But before before I turned so 19, your first my first season. season. Playing, so yeah. I played, I think 30 35 games in League Two. Played well, player of the year. And I'm seeing Grimes is linked here. Grimes is linked there. So I'm ringing my agent. Is that is that true? He's going no. Relax. Next one. Next story would come out a couple of days later. Is that, is that true? No, it's not. Relax. Like, if if a move happens, you'll be the first to know. I'll ring you, ring your family, da da da. To the point where I'm going on holiday, and I'm thinking, like, I'm looking at my phone, thinking, like, is it going to ring? Is it going to ring? And obviously, d- didn't move in that window. Um, so I thought, okay, I need to need to get my head back on back on playing. Um, not that not that I ever wanted to move, but you know, it, it kind of like is just there. Um, and then uh, for the first six, seven games of that second season, I was terrible. I was playing and, and not playing well. The manager dug me out a couple of times and it, it, he said something to me. He said, stop thinking about trying to be a good player and just be a good player. And I feel like that's what I was doing. I was actually like thinking, how do I, how do I play well today? Whereas before, I was just turning up on the pitch thinking, right, stay in the team and I'll play well. And then it kind of... Wasn't uh, wasn't a great start. How hard is that though? In obviously in hindsight, now you, you you've, that feedback from the manager at the time has probably stuck with you. But how hard it, was it at the time to get out of that habit of trying to look like a good player? Do you know what saved me? It was actually being called up by England twenties. I think I was in a real, real like not great place, and then I was called up by England. Me and Christy Pym at the time, um, we were the only two players from below the Championship that had been called up. Um, so that was like a massive confidence boost. Um, and I think without that, I don't know if I'd have got out of my slump. So we came back from international duty, played Mansfield at home. Uh, I was on the bench because we got back like the day before. I came on at half time and had a really good game, a really good game. And then from there, I kind of just like refocused and just went as if I was the, the season before. But I think without that, I think I'd have been like... How do I do it? How do I get back to, to how I was? And like at the time when you're a kid, you don't understand form. You don't understand how things work. You don't, you just don't 
take it in really it's tough that uh, you know I think I mean uh, just for being interested in football I've watched you play for years um, you, you, when you were much younger obviously in Exeter I was in teams in, at that level that w- would have obviously played against Exeter watching Swansea is something that a lot of neutral football fans do because it's you know it's a joy to watch but you in particular obviously you're You've had that experience now. I think it's great for people listening because there's a lot of young players, hopefully, that listen to us. There's a lot of guys, obviously, who are, who are having their careers already that may get to a period where they're not playing as well as what they want to do and they're finding it difficult to get back to their form. Mm-hmm. And the advice that you've just almost given yourself was that stop trying to think of what a good player looks like and just yeah. be yourself. How difficult actually is that to do? Uh, well, I think it. I think it starts every day. I think like consistency is the most important thing as a footballer. Well, in any walk of life, but as a footballer, I think if you do the same things over and over again, train well, eat well, sleep well, do everything right, form at the end of the day. Like form is temporary, as the the cliche saying, but it will come back. Like. You don't just become a bad player overnight. If you, if the manager takes you out for a couple of games, you need to just understand that it it will come back, and there will be a click, and you think, right, I've got it back now, and then and then just roll with it. The more you the more you think, oh, oh I ate that last night, and I've had a bad game. I, I I should eat something different, and like it can just spiral in your head. And I think that's where um, consistency comes into it because if you're doing the same thing all the time then it should have the same result. But as soon as that result doesn't come, people then start to change how they build up into games and how they think about the game and how they think about playing. And that's when it can get bad. You're obviously at that 18, 19 years of age, super talented. But what did you know about football at that point in terms of your lifestyle and and how to live, how to train? How did you have habits and, and routines and, and things like that or was, did, was it something you grew into? I think, yeah, I think that's something you pick up. I, I don't think any any player can say, oh yeah, 18, 19, I was doing this, this and this and I've carried it on throughout my whole career. Um, I come from a very solid family where you have to work hard, you have to give your best in everything you do. So that was the main building block, if you like, of, of how I used to go about things. But I don't think um, I don't think I really had many habits. I'd maybe eat similar things the, the day before. But obviously, I'm living at home, so I can't dictate to to what the food is. Um, even though I do do try. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't. I think it's just things as you progress in your career, as you go on, you think right. I need that. That made me feel good, so I'll stick with that and kind of build it through playing. I want to before we touch on obviously the the sort of period of time where you did obviously end up moving to Swansea. Um, I wonder if, what advice you would give to all the young players who have expectations put on them at a young age to achieve um, as to how they can fulfil that potential. Just don't don't think about it. I know I know it's easy these days, especially with social media becoming what it is to be like, oh, he's been bought for a million, he's only 16 years old, da-da-da-da. Like, People are, people are going to say what they want to say. People are going to have opinions. When you walk into a dressing room after just being bought for any amount of money, oh, oh he, he cost that, so he, he better be good. But obviously you, you don't get bought, you don't have the hype if, if you're not a good player. So you just, just carry on, just do exactly what you've been doing up until that point and just let football take you to, to where you want to be. If you go the other way and say, right, I've, I've been bought for X amount, I'm... I've done it, I've cracked it, that's when you start failing. So just carry on, keep doing the same things and build on what you've already done. And that's the only advice I'd really give, to be honest. Nice, mate. The, um, so fast forward a couple of years, obviously, from making your exit debut. In January 2015, as a 19-year-old, and January sometimes a weird window to, to move because yeah. you expect, uh, like years ago, I moved in a January window and, and you expect to go straight into that team that you've been bought by, but it, it doesn't really happen that way. You sometimes often go from being a, or one of the best players in the team that you're at to being another good player in a team that you've gone to and, and not necessarily being a main player. Um, what was the jump like? like was, it, was there anything that you struggled with straight away? Yeah, I think that just the tempo and the intensity of your training. I've always said it, like going from League 2 to the Premier League is like a big, big jump. So when I'm, I'm training, I'm playing in games, like everything's quicker, 
everything's sharper, everyone's, and this might sound a really stupid thing to say, but everyone's kicking it harder. Like, the passes are sharper, shots are faster, everything is just just better. Um, so as I'm playing, I'm, like, trying to wrap balls into people. It's getting cut out. I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, what's going on here? Like, have, have I just completely lost it? But it just takes time to to build in and, and to grow in, to get used to the environment. And that was... So when I moved, Exeter put to Swansea or made the suggestion that I'd be bought and then go back on loan for the the remaining six months. But obviously having having chats with my agent at the time and, and my family, it, it, we thought it would serve me better to just get in in January and uh, use that January to the summer as like an adaptation window so I can get used to the training, get up to speed, and then I can really start from from summer pre-season and kick on. Um, so I think I went with the acceptance, really, that I wasn't going to I wasn't gonna play. I wasn't going to start games like I was at Exeter. I was just hoping to maybe get a few games towards the end of, of the year, which I did, to be fair. What was the... Um, what did you expect training to look like then, and, and what was it like? like what were the... Uh, you know, I'm really interested in... So there's a lot of guys... Hopefully we'll, we'll get moves that listen to this that, that might want to know what to expect. You've gone from arguably the biggest leap, if you just touched on League Two to the Premier League, is enormous. I mean, the championship to the Premier League is enormous, but enormous. You're, now, you're, you're now obviously working with, with Premier League players, international players. I know that you've been involved in England and uh, uh, sort of the youth teams, but you're now around like f- top elite players. What, would a, what was your, you know... Um, vision of what it was going to look like as to what it actually was um, funnily enough I actually remember going there thinking right everyone's going to be like ultra professional not eat bad stuff not do this not do that everyone's going to be like in the best physical like shape possible and I actually thought like it wasn't the case at the time when I when I went in I thought ah, oh, like everyone's just normal like you meet you meet obviously Ash Williams, unbelievable player, unbelievable talent, like absolute athlete. John Joe Shelby, Gilfie Sigerson, um, Jack Court, Carl Norton, who's obviously still here now. And you just think like these players are normal guys, but the intensity at which they play, the sharpness of, of how they think and how the game looks to them is just like another level. It, it's it's crazy. You, you watch Norts now. And uh, a couple of the young lads, even even now, have said to me like, "How how does Norts make it look so simple? How does he make it look so slow?" And just because in his head, everything is moving at his pace, so he, he's never flustered. And when he's played right at the top, not the standard of the championship now, and and even like lower to him would be like so slow, and and he would just play it how how he would. And it just makes it look so easy. So I think that elite players, everything in their head just just happens faster. And because their bodies are more conditioned to deal with the pace of it, you've got your head thinking faster, your body able to move faster, and obviously the ability on the ball. So it's like everything is just better. That, that's the, the, the best way I can describe it. Everything is just better. Um, how long do you think then it was after, after you arrived that you sort of, not saying that you, that I'm in here, like, and, and I'm getting it, and I'm comfortable, but that you started to, yeah, feel more comfortable and, and start to feel, you, you, not, I wouldn't argue that you were never part of the group, but that you were on a level. If I'm really honest, I didn't, I never really felt on a level with with those guys. Um, I would say probably about three, four months until I felt like I can hold my own in training, I can train well, and and people would be like, oh, Grimesy was good today. So that was that was the first step, but because I never played consistently with the team, I don't think I can ever say I was on the level. Obviously, I've played in the prem, I've, I've made a couple of appearances, but I can't really say I was their level to say I'm I'm a prem player because they they were on a level com- completely different to me. Um, so I could hold my own in training. I'd, I'd train well. I'd play well when I got got an opportunity. I couldn't consistently play Premier League game, Premier League game, Premier League game, Premier League game because I wasn't good enough and I wasn't I wasn't at their level. What was that training ground environment then like? Uh, obviously, at in the Premier League, or oh, you know, you're still at the same club, but and I can imagine the training environment is is pretty similar. The way that you guys play, 
is the training ground environment like it, it and by that I mean are people doing a lot of extras like is there a lot of improvement going on there's a lot of teams as, as I'm sure are aware in, in football that you turn up you train you go home there's yeah. no real a coach it looks like you, at Swansea you, there's just always a coach who's the, the head man uh, you know the first team coach or the, or the manager all of you are always improving the team play with a certain style that takes a lot of effort on a training ground like what, what did that sort of training ground environment look like for you? Yeah, it's obviously everyone's doing their own thing. By the by, the time you get to to that age, experience and level, everyone's got their routines. Everyone knows exactly what they need from from each day. If if you train one day and it's it's a hard day and 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 you think right, I've I've played last weekend. We've had a Tuesday game and and I feel like not not don't really need it today. Take yourself inside. No worries. Week to week game. Lads need extras, sprints, high intensity. I feel like everyone knows, with the guidance of sports scientists, the coaches, and everything, everyone knows what they need to be at their at their peak. The younger lads are now watching the older lads, thinking, "Right, how do I get there? He's doing this, so I need to be doing that to make sure that I'm staying with it." And as you progress, as you make more appearances, get more game time, you know what you need to be at your your peak for for game day and I feel like that's where you draw on the experience of the older lads and it just creates a culture that everyone's pulling in the same direction everyone's doing exactly what they need to be the best they can be and that is ultimately what you need from a team So someone who plays like you you know gifted on the ball comfortable in position how what are you doing in training that, that might not be just part of the training session what are you doing on your own uh, away from the from the, the rest of the lads your extras what have you done over the years? What sort of secrets can can you give people at home as to what they they can do to help themselves? I feel like, I feel like, to be honest, extras wise, I wouldn't say that I I'm I do too much. What what I would say is, out of every training session, I try and not set myself a goal, but I, I well I've I can only speak what I've been doing recently. So recently, I've I've been looking a lot at how I can enable other players to to come out of their shell not come out of their shell but but play the best the best version of themselves so obviously as a player possession based want to get on the ball da, 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 da. but what can i do off the ball to help others have more time have more space because the best the best midfielders in the world know when to go and receive know when to play one touch know when to play two touch know when to not play at all so I feel like being the one that wants to be on the ball, dictate things, make things happen, when do I then need to take myself away and enable other... Because you see, you see holding midfielders, Pirlo was the perfect example. By the end of his career, teams were just saying, right, you, go and stand next to them. And that's it. Their, their sole purpose in life was don't let him get the ball. So if you watch him play, if he realises and understands that's happening... He will just move out of the way and let someone else come in, and then the team's still playing exactly the same way. It's not about it's not about one person. So obviously, this manager coming in with with his ideas, there is so much of that going on. If you're if you're not receiving the ball, you're enabling someone else to receive the ball, and I feel like that's what I'm thinking about a lot more recently. Um, so extras wise, I would say it's probably not so much physical for me. It's probably more more um mental and 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 thinking things through and and trying to take that tactical side of my game to the next level um i've actually been struggling with a pubis injury for about nine months now so my extras at the moment are doing everything i can to to make that easier to deal with i mean that is extra ultimately you know your body and and you're trying to put yourself in the best position to perform on the match day and mm. and that's something that a lot of people can actually take a lot from the extras doesn't necessarily mean you're staying on the pitch for two hours no that means you can go into the gym obviously and, and do what you're doing as well no of course and and with your with your um obviously we get scored on everything now hamstring strength groin strength deceleration power acceleration power everything is graded how you perform on the match day is graded so much but if you have a good game bad game so if one side of your physical performance is weak you need to improve it if a side of your te technical tactical that side of the game is weak you need to improve it so extra doesn't mean just stay out put the ball down and hit 
100 free kicks. It, it just is anything you can do on top of what the group is doing to make you better. Now, a lot of people in football, you know, you must come across a lot of them. They're, they're uninterested in football, really. They, they don't go away and, and really watch or talk about the game. Um, the last thing they want to be doing on, on an evening or on a weekend is watch football. But you sound as if that you're, you know, that you're into it. You, you like to watch it. You like to watch players. You like to try and get better by studying others. And you just talking about Pirlo then obviously gives me the perception of, of that you are looking for more knowledge of, of others. I'm interested to know for the benefit of others is that the this, you know, let's call it goal setting that you that you do in training, that you, you're not, you're just going into training and, and doing what you're told. You're actually thoughtful about it. You want to improve, whether that be mental, or technical, or physical, whatever it is. How do you build those uh, opinions up yourself? Like, well, give me an insight into how that works. Do you sit at home and watch other games, or is it a conversation with the manager? What What is it? I don't. I don't think. I don't want to paint myself to be like this football guru that just goes home and sits down and and, <laughs> yeah. and just watches all games because that is not true in the slightest. Um, but I just think you can never ever stop learning like, about anything about football, not about football. So, take football for example. If if Barcelona play. PSG in in the Champions League why would you not want to watch that because the players that are playing in that game are the elite of the elite so what they do every day gets them to that level so if you can watch the player in your position and understand what he's doing why he's doing it how the team wants to function then how can that not be a positive because you learn so much from people that are well, they are above you, so I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't. I totally agree. Um, I can't believe some people don't don't watch those sort of games and come in on a Monday looking to talk about the game and they're not I'm interested. Not, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to sit at home and watch game, game, game back to back and like your missus saying, "Oh, should we do something?" No, no, no. I've got, I've got to watch what you like. That's that's not life. It's not, it's not how it works. But like I say, massive game like that, Real Madrid, whoever, Man City, think like. Surely, I think just watching football with a view to appreciating the players that are on on show. It might be a, it might be another championship game that you, that you're watching. You're sort of watching the way that different teams play or different players play. It might like be guys who play in non-league watching another non-league game and and seeing how different. I think it's just so much, so much to take from from watching mm. the game mm. rather than just thinking about it. Because it, I always find if I overthink football. I could get myself into a position where like I'm just making things up in my head, like yeah, situations yeah. that don't exist. Because yeah. when I watch it, I'm obviously watching real things happen. I could take much more from that than I can about just sort of going through my mind. Yeah, it? yeah. I, I, th- I think the best example for that is when you're on the bench. When you're watching the starting eleven, because obviously, ultimately, when, when you're watching football at home, you could be on your phone, kids could run in, distracted by other things. But when you're sat on the bench, you are literally solely focused on the game. So when the ball comes into the player that's playing in your position and he does something, you think, would I do it like that? Or would I have done something else? And I feel like when you watch the better players, if you think, would I have done it like that? And the answer's no, I'd have done this. Then maybe you need to rethink what you're doing. I'm not saying that they're always right. They always make the right decisions, but... Nine times out of ten, their decision making is going to be better than yours because that's why they're at that level and not not yours. I'm conscious sometimes with, with these podcasts that you know uh, we talk to guys obviously uh, who who play elite football, and at the moment you're Swansea's captain, you play um, a certain style that it, you know that people love to watch. Um, I'm talking about you know managers saying you're the best young player ever. And I'm I'm conscious that I don't want to paint a perfect picture of you, and that everything you've done in your life has been perfect because, you know, I'm sure that's that's not really the case. Um, and there was obviously a period of time where you've moved from Exeter to Swansea in the Premier League. Um, you're now not playing as many games as what you were before, and you end up finding yourself on loan. Um, and actually, like it uh, written down here somewhere, is that um, I think it was the Leeds loan that you went on that you've publicly done an interview and said that that was a real difficult time, uh, you know, in, in your career. I wonder if you could just go into a little bit more detail as to, to what was dic- difficult about those loans, about that period of time in your career and how you, you know, go on to, to manage to get over that. So it was, um, it was the Blackburn loan to start with where I just needed to get out and, 
and just get football because I was it, it was the time where you didn't have to go on loan in a specific window. You could just go whenever. So I think I went in February until the end of the season. So I went there, got games, started playing more, got called up to, to England 21s. I thought, right, perfect. Right, I've got my got my career back on track. Next year, I need to go on loan again. So went on loan to Leeds. I thought, I've just played in the Championship. I'm in England and under-21 international, right? I'm going to go to Leeds. I'm going to play. And I feel like I felt, because I was coming from a Premier League team to a Championship team, I'm going to play. There's there's no reason why I shouldn't play. I'm a Premier League player. Like I've come from a Premier League team, so I'm going to play. And that obviously is not the case. That is not how football works. You need to earn your place. You need to work as hard as possible to make sure that the person beside you doesn't take your shirt. And I just could not have been further off it in pre-season. I was... I was rocking up to training sessions just thinking, oh, I just need, to, just need to get through this. I just need to get through training. And then I got a game at the weekend, so like, I'll play in that, no, no problem. And it was the last pre-season game where Gary Monk did, who, who was the manager at Leeds at the time, he did a thing where you'd play 60 minutes of one game, 30 minutes of another game, and then it would be 90 minutes for, or ninety near 90 minutes for the lads that are in his starting 11 for the following week where the season starts. And I wasn't in it. I wasn't in the eleven. So I'm thinking, what well, something wrong here? Like I don't, I don't really think I've done anything wrong. And I was obviously uh, on upon reflection, thinking back, how I took those training sessions and how I took the approach to preseason, where I just thought, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to play. And it was a we played. Um, I played Peterborough, um, in in a preseason friendly. I felt like I had a decent game. Like it was fine. And I was shattered. Like I was, and I mean, I was shattered. It was a hot day. It, we'd had a long couple of weeks. I'd played, obviously, did did loads of running and stuff before, like normal preseason. Played the game, knackered. Again, I need to just go home. We had two days off. I need to just go home, rest, put my feet up, chill. Ended up going out that night, the Saturday night, and then obviously, absolutely dead to the world. Sunday, Monday, I'm just like trying to piece myself back together. And then Tuesday we've got training, which is normally like a tough session. And I'm still not feeling right by the Tuesday. And I'm just thinking, just need to get through it. Like, get through training today, get through training tomorrow. And then Thursday, Friday will be all right. And then we've got a game of the weekend. And I think that's how I kind of took the whole of pre-season. And then, like I said before about um, my time where you have a wake-up call. I've had my wake-up call now, the final game pre-season. I'm thinking, I'm not in the team, so what's going on here? And then the next week, I was on it in training. So first game of the season comes around, QPR away. And I'm like, right, I've had a good week's training. I'm, I'm in a good place here. I had a stinker. I was terrible. You can't train like a bag of nonsense for five weeks, six weeks pre-season, and then think, oh, no, I need to play well here and then just turn it on for four days, and then perform well. It's just not how it works. So I've had a stinker. You know what social media is like. You know what Leeds fans, I presume, are like. Um, yeah, my fam- my missus family are Leeds fans. So oh, yeah, are they? I'm aware, yeah. They probably hate me as well then. So, um, so, uh, so I'm getting all sorts of stick, which obviously is fair enough. We just got beat 3-0. I'd, I was poor. And to be honest with you, I don't think I'd ever recovered from that. For the whole season, I don't think I'd recovered. I only started to feel like myself again in November. And I only remember that because it was international break. I'd not been playing, so I was like, right, need to get away, need to get my head straight. Went away, came back. And then from then, I was was at it. But the damage had already been done. So then I'm not playing. I'm maybe coming on for... 10-20 10-20 minutes every game and then I start a game um, FA Cup away to Sutton who were obviously they were I think they're in League 2 now aren't they? they're in League 2 now they're in, League they're in the National now. League at the yeah, time but, they? or lower uh, maybe lower could have been not, could have been in the National League South remember Jamie Collins scored a penalty yeah so yeah so we lost that and then obviously where'd you go from there it's now it's now January February 
I've just been beat by Sutton and I've not played well. And now I've got four months left of the season and I'm not doing anything. I'm not playing. So the the five, six weeks of pre-season where I was miles off it affected my whole year. And I feel like that is the damage it can do when you're thinking, I'm going to play. I'm going to play. I'm fine. I've, I've played well in, in um, the championship last year. I've gone on an under-21 camp with the likes of Ward Prowse, Grealish, da 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 Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good player. I'm a top player. I'll, I'll be playing here. Crap for six weeks. Ruined my whole season. How, how long was it that, that did it take you to realise that that, how much that, that had affected you and how your approach to that pre-season had affected you? Because, you know, you're a top player now. Like, you've always been a top player, but... You've obviously had moments in your career that you've managed to really learn from uh, and quite a lot of people don't learn from those experiences. Quite a lot of people really sink, really, from, from that loan happens, you come back and suddenly you think, oh, I've not really worked out at Swansea, so I want to leave. And suddenly then you're on a steady decline down mm-hmm. the leagues. Uh, that didn't happen to you. So when did you realise that, you know, that what you'd done and how did you manage, what did you, you how did you use that to, to then progress? So... um it was, like, having these conversations just, like, sparking things <laughs> in my head. So it was, I came on at half-time um, against Brighton for Leeds um, at the, the, the back end of the season, and it was on Sky. So my mum and dad had it recorded on their Sky box. So in the summer, I'm flicking through what to watch. I see, oh, Brighton, Leeds. So I click that. I play the second half, so I click that. And I'm watching just, like, bits of it. And I just I'm watching myself on the TV, and I'm just like a shadow of of what I perceive in my head to be me. This ball's going past me. I'm saying I should have intercepted that. I I like get played the ball from one centre half, and there's no one around me, and I play it to the other centre half, and I'm like, why have you not turned? Like, and it's it's the type of things that I can imagine as a fan. You're watching on TV. Like, even I would do it now. If if a player turns in plays into the midfielder and there's no one around him and he doesn't turn, I'd say to him, oh, turn. Do you know what I mean? So it's like I'm criticizing myself for, for doing this. And obviously this is after the, the loan spell has ended. So I'm just thinking, flipping hell, how how do I get back to to where I was from that? Because I'm watching myself on the TV, and don't get me wrong. I've been called all the names under the sun by Leeds fans. Get out of our club. You're, you're this, you're that. Death threats, like the lot. Um, so I'm watching myself now on the TV and I'm thinking, I like half agree with you because I'm, I'm awful. And then I'm thinking, right, how do I get myself from that to what I was before? Um, so that's when myself, my family, my agents, we, we decided, look, I need to just, get out on loan again, but just play every minute possible. So championship loan, probably not realistic after after what happened. And I was absolutely fine with that because I didn't deserve it. Go to League One, Northampton, and I'm like, right, obviously League One's not the level I want to be at, but I'm just going to give absolutely everything I can, day in, day out, try and be the best player on the pitch. To, to be honest, probably put a little bit too much pressure on myself. Um, but I just needed to play and just fall back in love with footy, and and that's what I did there. To be fair, I know. Well, well, I've done a, obviously a lot of research the last couple of weeks on, you know, those loans and um, uh, each season how it went, what people were saying, and and Northampton, you end up playing really, really well. I know, it was sort of, you're thinking that the level, you might think in your mind the level was beneath you, but you still you've got to play well, even mm-hmm. even when you're there. Well, at the, at, I knew my potential. I knew that I I needed and wanted to be a championship or Premier League footballer. So I didn't feel like Northampton or League One was beneath me by any stretch of the imagination for the position that I was in. Because I needed... I, I, I personally would have even gone to League Two. Mm. I just needed to be... If, if no one in League One would have taken me, I would have gone to League Two. And that's where I feel like players these days... And without being stereotypical, it's probably the Premier League young lads that will say, "Oh, League Two, League One. What, what am I going there for? Like, that's I'm, I'm miles better than that." But then you see in the is it the Papa Johns? 
Yes, Papa John's Trophy. Where they, where they the play. The 21s, yeah. Yeah, they play the 21s against Bristol Rovers. Yeah. Bristol Rovers 5-0. Like, they're, they're, Bristol will play their reserves and you'll play, you're on the 21 team and you get slapped 5-0. So how can you feel like you're above the level? You need to get out. You need to play games. You need to build yourself into a footballer because 21s, 23s football is just not, it's not football. It is, it is, and it's, it's a good building block to then go and play games. But then you need to then play those games, if that makes sense. You need I totally to, agree. You, you, can't, you can't be like, ah, oh, 21, oh, this is nice. Da, 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 da. Not really playing for anything. Come to a weekend and you're playing in League 2 for Exeter, for example. You give away a penalty, last minute goal. Manager's absolutely caning you. But those are the experiences you need to build to be to be a, a top player. I think we, we actually talk about Rovers. With, when I was there, we had a guy called Mark Bowler, left back who plays at Middlesbrough now. And he was on loan from Arsenal. I remember speaking to him about the other guys in because we played against the Arsenal under 21s, Papa John's. I'm not sure how the game went. But Mark was playing in that team. Super talented. Ended up coming to us on, on loan and probably thought like, oh, like what, what am I doing here? But he, he ended up playing a load of games that his teammates at Arsenal weren't. Mm. And now, obviously, he's, he might not be at Arsenal, but he's playing at Middlesbrough. He plays, you know, I've got an eye on him, plays week in, week out. He's doing really well. Mm. And I don't think with those early experiences of playing at Rovers in, you saw that League One environment, that he maybe would have gone on to now be having a proper career in the Championship. 100% agree. 100% agree. I, I couldn't advise stronger that lads in those setups just need to get out. You need to get out. You need to play games. You need to... Go wherever you can just to, and it's not. There's gonna be there's gonna be days like you you would know as well as like League Two, League One, where there's you're playing against a team full of men. They're smashing it long. You're getting headed, kicked. You're getting booted all over the place. But they are the building blocks for your career. You then know when you go into the championship and you're playing against similar players, but with just way more experience, you can deal with it. And I don't think I think if you sit and stay comfortable in your your nice environment, lovely training ground, food brilliant. I just don't think you get it. And I think those lads get found out. Before we move on, like I'm really interested in, in talking about the journey that you've been on to become Swansea's captain. But before we, we do do that, you mentioned there, and we sort of flipped past it a little bit, but I want to touch on it because it's relevant in sort of modern game, is that you speak about Leeds fans and, and how they talk about you and the things you read about yourself now obviously with with a smile on your face and and you can t- sort of laugh about it but i can't imagine during the time that you that you managed to to deal with that that way or or did you no nah. so this is what what i mean is in high, like we'll talk about hindsight all the time and, and on different conversations and that you can now look back on those experiences because you're you, you know you're a top player who, who's used everything to to progress but at the time that must have been ridiculously difficult to to see and read and and hear that sort of stuff said about you like what what was that like um yeah yeah not good <laughs> not good i was 21 years old living away from home um and it, it wasn't it wasn't the first time i'd i'd moved away but but it just got like and uh, to be honest with you when i moved when i first moved to leeds i don't think i really had an idea of what a big club was because you talk about Leeds, you talk about Man United, you talk about Forest, like massive, massive history in their clubs. And I don't think I understood that as a young lad. So I've gone there, everyone, everyone's saying, because you know Leeds fans, they're everywhere. A couple of lads warning me, oh, Leeds fans are like bang on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. But then as soon as you have one bad game, you're abused, not good enough, not fit to wear the shirt, da, da, da. Two bad games, gets a bit worse. Three, four, and then I've ended up having, I think I played like 10 times for them. So I've had 10 bad games, and then the, the nail in the coffin was the Sutton one. And I come off I come off the pitch, and I'm, I'm looking through my phone, obviously just, just flicking through. And like the amount of message requests that were just like, don't get me wrong, some of them, you're shit, you're this, you're that, like, F off out of our club. Like, you can understand them ones. But then ones where, oh, I hope I hope you and your family die of cancer, and it's like, 
come on. Like, I understand the passion of, of especially the Leeds fans. Like, Leeds fans are, the, the times I've played there, they're unbelievable. But stuff like that, you're 21 years old. It's too much. It, it's way too much, way too far. And I feel like, I feel sorry for the young lads today because I feel like it's only getting worse. It's part of the reason why, you know, I'm trying to talk about it, is those experiences that you've gone through. You've got some thick skin, mate, to, you know, because you're super talented. I know we've spoken about it and I mentioned it. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but super talented. But like in, in environments like that, it's quite easy not to be able to perform. You've obviously gone, so on, easy. You've gone on to be able to perform. But like in, in that environment where people are on your case and you suddenly your shoulders are a bit heavier and it's more difficult for you to be yourself. Do you know, do you know the best thing, the best thing that happened to me was after the Sutton game when I'm getting all this abuse, like people it even got to a point where I would do I would do nothing wrong. So it's like a week, two, three weeks after after um after the game. And I'm in Nando's by myself. I live by myself, so I'd it's bit, I don't know if people might find this a bit sad, but I used to go cinema by, by myself and then go Nando's after. I right. think a lot of football guys go cinema on their own. Unreal, you know, people don't realise <laughs> that it's actually a thing that people do. Honestly, one of the yeah. best things ever. Um, so I go cinema by myself, go Nando's. Phone phone pings. I've oh, just seen just seen at Matt Grimes in Nando's, which to start with is just a weird tweet in itself. Thirty replies. I'm thinking, what can, what can people possibly be saying there? Scrolling through it, I oh, hope he hope he chokes on a chicken bone and dies. And I'm like. I've I've literally gone to the cinema, gone for food, and people are saying I hope I hope he dies in the thingy. And don't get me wrong, I, I think sometimes people say it as a, in as jest, a joke, yeah. yeah. But it's just like, it's but there was like thirty of them, thirty saying like, I hope he gets food poisoning. I hope it, I hope, and it's just like also negative. So then the best thing that happened to me was I didn't play for the rest of the season. I didn't play. Because there's times where I'd step on the pitch and think, oh, I'd give that ball away. I wonder what people are saying about me. And it's like, you, you can feel people, like you play, you play a dyer, goes out of play, and you think, like, oh, people are probably getting their phones out. Like, oh, Matt Grimes is shit. It's like, it's so hard, it's so hard to deal with, so hard. And then, obviously, by the end of the season, I I was just I think it was like two weeks. I didn't leave my flat. I was going I was going home, going training, going home, get ordering like Tesco's or whatever delivery. Didn't did not leave my flat for the last two weeks. And then as soon as as soon as because I thought we were going to make playoffs, but we didn't make playoffs in the end. As soon as that happened, delivery van or not delivery van, um, removal van, take all my stuff, get me out of it. And then that was that. I don't think people. Really understand, and by people I mean other players, young players. Really understand that that is possible. Like the the, I think everybody thinks, oh, fans are going to let. And don't get me wrong, you've said it all, already. People love to be loved. Mm. Players love to be loved. There's yeah. no better feeling than, than fans that that appreciate you and, and think you're a good player. But when they don't, or for whatever reason you don't perform and, and you get negative criticism, it's it's incredibly difficult to deal with. And I don't care who you are, what level you play at, it is super tough. I can't like. Talking about the elite of the elite, Manchester United, uh, you know, go Harry Maguire for example. Oh Let's God, did yeah. you know? Like I can't only imagine how like how much weight off his shoulders oh. he feels the last couple of weeks oh. that I haven't played a game. Unbelievable, mm. unbelievable. I bet he feels light as a feather. Yeah, because it it got to the stage where like I, I'm seeing stuff about him and I'm thinking, I, I, mate, I feel so sorry for you because he's not. Don't get me wrong. If you, if you make a mistake for a goal at that level, it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram. You get in, you get in battered by people who have never kicked the ball before. But towards the like the end of it, they're saying, "What's Harry Maguire doing here? He's not done anything wrong. He's literally like the the agenda against him was just outrageous." And it is the same for so many for, like Pogba before he left. Everything was his fault. So I feel like. If you're if you're that player in that like everyone needs a scapegoat, even at Northampton I was a little bit as well. Because I was on loan and we got relegated, people thought that I didn't care, which was like you can ask any of the lads that that were there with me, like I I like was distraught that we, we couldn't stay up. But I feel like once you're in that 
spotlight and and people are gunning for you, you can't get out. And it's, it's so much worse these days. So much worse. It is. Yeah, it is. It's horrendous. And you know, I play at a level that there's not loads of fans. Like people don't talk about me after games just because those those fans don't really exist. But yeah. at, at the top level, obviously they do, and it's so obvious that. And and a couple of the conversations that I've had that I'll give you an insight to. So. Um, uh, Adam Webstow's at Brighton at the moment. He's playing fantastically well. Obviously, yeah. he's getting linked to in, like in the linked to Chelsea when they they couldn't sign uh, for Fana recently. And I've had a conversation with him when he was a young guy at Portsmouth, and he was getting dogs abuse at, at Portsmouth. People were like, even when he didn't play, he tells a story about how um, somebody had tweeted him. Somebody else had made a mistake for a goal, and somebody had tweeted him Webby saying. Um, don't worry at whoever it was that made a mistake you'll never be as bad as Adam Webster like and he was just getting it all the time every day every game and he found it super difficult to deal with and now he's playing at you know at the top of the Premier League Brighton a fantastic team at the moment and he's managed to come through those experiences you've managed to come through those experiences I'm sure we're talking about elite elite players this Harry Maguire situation he's still the same guy that was in the team of the Euros like yeah, uh, the yeah. year before. Like he's obviously a talented footballer. He's just yeah. in an environment at the moment that he's finding it really difficult to to play well in, as you were, as Webby was. Yeah. What is your advice for for young? It might not even be young guys, but young guys, current pros who are in that environment that feel the weight on their shoulders, that are you know that aren't able to go on the phone without seeing you know somebody saying something negative about them how like how did you ultimately manage to to overcome that and and how can you now look back on that period with a smile instead of thinking that ruined my life because i'm sure it did at the time i think only because i am where i am now i can look back on it with a smile because it would have been very 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 understandable if i'd have then just not made it back not made it back from alone at League One, because at the end of that, obviously I've been I've been to Leeds, I've got dogs abuse, I've gone to Northampton, I've been relegated League One. Where where do you go from there? And it's only because I am where I am now that I can look back at it and say I've I've drawn on on the the positives from from those experiences because at the time there is no positives, and that is that is the the biggest takeaway from it when you're in it you can't you can't think about it any other way apart from this is horrible this is horrendous but as long as it doesn't start i spoke before about um consistency and just keeping doing the same things as long as it doesn't affect what you're doing on a daily basis then you just got to ride it out but as soon as it as soon as it starts I don't, I don't know, for an example, if you're a keeper and your goal kicks aren't good, oh, he can't kick for this, he, he's crap. Da, 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 da. Every day then you're doing more and more goal kicks, goal kicks, every, every even though that's not part of your, your consistent routine, that's how it can like have a negative effect as well. As soon as you let people in and let them start dictating your decisions, that's when you start to you start to fail. What's the there's a saying about this one as well. I feel like a, a wise man that water can only sink a ship if it gets inside. Something like that. It's nice. Like it floats on the water, yeah, but good. as soon as you let it in, it sinks. We'll quote that. So, well, I don't know. If, <laughs> you have to Google the actual quote. But it's, the, it's exactly the same concept. If you let what these people are saying get in inside and let it affect you like that, then you've got no chance. And especially these days, if any younger younger lads are listening to to these podcasts, like it's only going to get worse. So you need to respect the fam your the opinions of your family, your mates to a certain extent, because if they don't play football, you can't really, and and your manager and your teammates, and that's it. So how does uh I've you know I've read different articles, the Swansea's forgotten man. <laughs> Go from being the so-called forgotten man to the captain of you know a massive football club. I know that's it, it, that's a broad question to to ask because there's many things I can imagine that have happened in between. But how do you think you go from from not being at the club for a couple of seasons on loan to coming back and you know eventually being made captain? What Gra- happened, Graham Potter? That's it. <laughs> da, da, da. There's not he he gave me an opportunity when no one else would have. I think he did a 
he did an interview um, when I like broke into the team and started playing, and he he even said himself that the whole aura around me was negative. He said there was just so many people saying negative things to him about me. Oh yeah, he's been on loan and failed. He failed at Leeds. He got relegated to Northampton, but he obviously made his own own decision. Um, I showed him that he could rely on me to do whatever whatever he needed me to, and he gave me my chance. And I I I honestly do not think well I wouldn't be here today, captain of this club if it if it wasn't for him. So what were the what were the main things then that that happened with him? Um, not so. So he um, Mar- how were you able to go from? So Martin Olsen was away with Sweden. So as a left-footed midfielder, he was like, right, I need someone to play left back. So he's got Grimesy. Can you can you fill in at left back? It was like pre-season game. So I was like, yeah, no worries. And where I was mentally, I needed to do anything I could. So that that's the difference between this preseason and the preseason at Leeds. I've gone into Leeds thinking I've I'm alright, I'm gonna play. This preseason I've got no chance of playing. I'm just gonna do everything I can to make a good account of myself. So I saw the left back position as a kind of like foot in the door, really. So I've shown him then that he can trust me playing out of position. And to be fair, I played it quite well. So then started the season, another setback because Martin came back um, and played the first game of the season. But I knew in my head, I'm sat on the bench and I'm thinking, right, Martin's back in now, but he's been away. He's never, ever going to last 90 minutes. So 70 minutes, Grimesy. You're coming on. 20 minutes. At a decent 20 minutes, we ended up winning the game. So I've then used, not that specific game, but used being a left back, playing out of position to kind of get my foot in the door, like I say, and and try and play more and more games. And I took that season exactly how I took the start of my exit career. Get in the team, stay in the team, play well. That's all I cared about. So... I'm playing left back, have a good game, stay in the team as a left back. Okay, stayed in, stayed in, stayed in. I know for a fact Martin's going to come back soon, but I'm playing so well that the manager can't then take me out. So then I get my chance in midfield. So it's like four or five games into the season. I've been on, I've been on the bench for, for those four or five games, but I know at some point I'm, I'm going to play in midfield. So I get my opportunity midfield, uh, Millwall away, Courtney Baker-Richardson gets sent off in the first two minutes. Brilliant. So I'm thinking, I've got my chance now and and we're down to 10 then. We're obviously going to lose the game. Ended up winning the game 2-1. So I've had my opportunity. I've played well. We've won the game. And I'm just thinking, right, I, I just need to stay in the team by, by any way necessary. Like, if he wants me to play midfield, I'll play there. If he wants to play left back, I'll play there. I ended up playing left centre half at, at times. So that whole season, stay in the team, 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 until I sh- showed the manager that he could trust me so much to the point where I'm then getting called into meetings with Leroy and Mike van der Horn, who were captain and vice captain at the time. Like, I'm now in those meetings. And I'm thinking, oh my God, how have I gone from the forgotten man not playing at all? So now, by the end of the season, there's five games left, and I'm like in captains' meetings with Mike and Leroy. How how has that happened? And it was just because I literally just took, and it's such a cliche, take a game at a, a time. So I've played well, stay in the team, play well, play well, play well, play well. And don't get me wrong, I came out, I came back in, and and there was obviously tough moments because it's my first season of the championship, but just focused solely on my performance and that took me to to where I was. Consistent every day, did my gym, thought, right, I've not had the facilities that we've got at Swansea in the last two years, so I'm going to smash gym, upper body, lower body, core, everything, get myself in the best physical position to be able to play all these games. And then, yeah, I just kind of went along and did it. And because he gave me an opportunity, I showed I could tr- he could trust me. What was that? I'm obviously discussing your career in, in a lot of detail. I think the the most you've excelled by the sounds of things is when you've managed to only focus on short term gains instead of long term gains, and when you've not allowed 
success that you've had to affect what you're doing moving forward. Yeah. That seems that seems to be the the, the trick. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of changes because obviously where where I'm at now, I'm capped in, I'm twenty seven, I'm I'm established championship player. It kind of changes. I'd I I like to take a little bit more of a um a role helping out the younger lads as well. So I'm focusing game day, my performance, the team's performance, that is the number one priority. But then obviously during the week, he's not had a great game. So is he okay? Does he need anything from me? So you kind of build on that. But the the fundamental and start point for me was play well, stay in the team. And, and that kind of took me to the end of Potter, same same first year with with Steve Cooper, second year Steve Cooper, and now. I mean, you, you're a young captain, and um, you know I'm sure there's guys in your team, obviously a little bit older than you. And um, I've spoken to other guys who, who've who've been young captains and said that that was you know a strange situation when there, there's there's arguably players who are maybe better qualified to take on that role that that aren't, and and that you and and those other guys are trusted with that. How did you? How did you your football lifestyle change once you were given that responsibility, or or did it in any way? Uh, it did a lot to start with, and I think I went about it completely the wrong way. So I was obviously given the armband by Steve Cooper, and I'm thinking, right, I'm the captain now. I need to be involved in everything, and that's just not the way to be. It it, it was like from 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 um, the the marketing at the club. Oh, you need player appearances. Oh, yeah, don't worry. I'll I'll take care of that. I'll I'll let the lads know. Um, bonus schedule. Yeah, no worries. Like, let me do it. And I was taking so much on, and then I kind of fell away from my not. I didn't fall away from my performances, but I think it was having like a detrimental effect on on my game because I was just taking so much on. I was thinking about so much. I had so much in my head. Um, Plus, I was thinking, right, I need to help the young lads. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that senior figure now. I need to do that. And I'm 24 years old. So I did do a lot of learning in the first couple of years about being a captain. And I feel like I still am now. I'm, I'm not by any means the finished article. Um, but yeah, I, I, I took far too much on early doors. So what if you could go back to that first period where you were given that armband, what do you think that you would do differently? Um, probably lean on... Because we had Wayne, Nath, Norts, Mike van der Horn. We had quite a, a lot of senior lads still. Um, so I would probably say lean on them a little bit more than I did because I thought, well, I'm the captain now, so everything's got to go through me. But that's it's such a, a an old-fashioned way of looking at it. Like, ah, oh, a captain's got to be the loudest. He's got to be the one in charge of everything. No, that's that's absolutely not the case. Captain leads by example every single day, which I feel like I do. And the captain delegates and, and helps people through, takes control of certain things, but will also let others lead in, in their own way as well. Um, and I, I really felt like um, I learned that just more and more as I, as I grew into the role. I think it's genuinely quite incredible the experiences that you went through before being established at Swansea, um, I've allowed you to go on and, and obviously do what, do what you've done. Do you think those experiences help you now to be able to guide the young players at, at, at the club? Do you think you're you know you're a good example, obviously, to them as to to what can be done through negative and positive experiences? Um, yeah, well, I like to think so. <laughs> I like to think so. But I I would just say like if any if any of the young lads are going through anything similar, I like to think that I can draw on my experiences to give them advice. It might help, it might not, but I feel like I've been through so much in my career already that I'm fairly well equipped to talk about and help out with things that they go through because more than likely I've been through a similar scenario. Touching on your on your style of play, mate. We've sort of spoken about it a little bit, and obviously Swansea. If, if you know, if people don't watch Swansea, then they should. Um, you guys play a certain style of football, and and obviously that helps you with the game that you have um, and the attributes that you've got. And in the research that I've done, obviously to, leading up to this conversation, 
I read something that was quite interesting. You said you'd rather finish lower in the table playing a certain style of football than you would finish higher playing a, an ugly style of football. Um, and, you know, football's full of a, a, opinions. Different people would say, oh, no, I'd rather win and, and be ugly and, and this, that and the other. What, what you know, I know you want to win. That's, you know, that's that's the given. But what was it that, that obviously has built that opinion? Um. I, I I personally feel like every team needs an identity. You need, whether you smash it long, whether you play out from the back, whether you do a bit of both, every team needs an identity. Our identity is, is possession football. I believe in our manager and the way that we play so much that I would rather lose doing it how we do it than win coming away from what to do because I believe that if we do what we do for a long period of time we're going to be successful it's just it, it will just happen because we don't deter from how we judge ourselves things we need to improve on details everything is in black and white like you know where you stand what we want to do because You'd have been the same. How many times have you played a game, you've lost, co- come into the meeting room on the Monday, and the manager's going, you should have been there, you should have been there, and you're kind of like, well, we've not worked on that at all, all season, so how am I supposed to know that I should be there doing this? We are so well structured, organised, everyone knows their roles at all times. So I just think if you have that level of consistency throughout the season you will win more games than you lose and that's my point it's not I would rather lose than win that is not the case at all obviously I would rather win but I would rather win doing it the way we're doing it because I feel like without being disrespectful so many teams say right we can have a go playing this year we're going to play we're going to play out from the back we're going to press high six games in Lost, lost three on the bounce. Can't do it. Stick it long, and that is like how? How can you ever build anything? How can the players ever trust in what you're saying? Because you've gone from we're going to pass it to we're going to shell it in six weeks. So how how does that? How can you build a winning team doing that? And don't get me wrong, the team could shell it all year get in the playoffs, get promoted, or go up automatically, whatever. Obviously, there's so there's so many managers that have had success off the back of solid defensively, longer balls, areas, and and play from there, which is, which is absolutely fine because that is their style. That's the way they do it. No problem at all. I actually have more respect for the managers that say, not say, but just know that that is what they are. I don't have respect for the managers that say, right, yeah, well, I want I want it to play. I, I, I want it to be like a possession-based team, but the players aren't good enough, so we'll just, just, we'll just stick it long. That can't be the case. It, it really, really can't. I mean, I don't, I don't obviously know the ins and outs, but I would expect our budget for players is probably one of the lower teams in the championship, like squad-wise. Our average age is about 23. But we're still playing the football we're playing because the manager believes in it so much, the players believe in it so much, and that is how we're going to take it forward. And that that is fundamentally the um, the take home from it. We wouldn't rather lose than win. Yeah, of course. Rather yeah. win doing it the way that we're doing it. So, how important do you think in in the game, especially the modern game, a lot of young players as you just touched on there. You've got a young team are able to adapt the different styles of play if they ultimately want to be successful in the game because, you know, you found yourself in an, in, in an environment where um, you've been at Swansea for a long time. Every manager that they recruit is uh, sort of of the same ideas and, and um, I w- can't imagine the owners would, would end up getting a manager who wants to, to play a different style. They, they have to sort of buy into that Swansea way. Mm-hmm. But if you want a successful career, it's very rare that you, that you stay at the same club the whole time. Yeah. And you're going to have to obviously be able to adapt to different ideas, different styles of play. How important do you think it is that people understand or young guys understand before they get into it that they're going to have to know how to p- 
play different roles in different teams. Yeah, I think that is massive, massive. Because, like you say, you're not you're never going to play for the same manager for your entire career. Like that's that's just not going to happen. Um, and you need to be adaptable because, say, say Brighton for example now. So it, it's looking like Potter's going to leave. So say they got in, for example, a Neil Warnock, obviously retired, but it's not going to happen. But then the lads, if they want to stay in the team and they want to excel, they need to buy in to, to how the manager is wanting to play. And that is going to be the opposite to Graham Potter. So when I spoke about before, play well, stay in the team, that is just doing everything you can to be the best version of yourself for that particular team. Whether that be... So I, I, at Blackburn, I played left wing back and all the manager wanted me to do on my left foot, receive from the centre half, turn, channel. And that is obviously not how I want to play. But to stay in the team, you need to do what he wants you to do, if that makes sense. So it's all well and good being like... Oh, yeah, but I don't, I don't agree with that. Like, it's a, it's a rubbish style of play. Da, 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 da. Yeah, you might not agree with it, but at the end of the day, you're a footballer. You need to be playing. You need to be able to play different roles, different scenarios, sometimes even different positions to to have a successful career. Hundred percent agree. Um, Going to finish off, mate. With I call them quick fire, but I'll ask you questions about them, so they're more slow fire, really. Do. <laughs> um, <laughs> What is the best piece of advice you've ever received in your career? Um, I think that one that I touched on earlier. Don't don't ever accept an opinion from someone you wouldn't ask advice from. Yeah, I like that one. Um, what, in your opinion, has been your best performance ever? Best performance ever? Is that there's so many you can't think of them or, or no? Not, not but enough. there's there's we we played Man City in the cup with. Graham Potter and I scored a penalty and I just remember that feeling I've spoke about it on interviews before I remember the feeling of stepping up to take the penalty everyone's like nervous on the video like you can see Graham's like not looking he's, he's not having it but like I was so confident at that time of my career that I was never ever going to miss ever but when I, when I spotted the ball and took my steps back Edison looked so small in the goal Honestly, and uh, it was just like a feeling of complete, like almost arrogance. Like I just felt so supremely confident. I'd, I was never going to miss, never ever. So from that feeling, I would have to say that game. Yeah, I like that one. Um, the most difficult, we've touched on it a little bit, the most difficult moment of your career. Yeah, Leeds. Mm. Leeds. Do you look back on that sort of period? And, uh, we have spoken about it quite a bit, but. That experience ultimately is, do you think that's made you a better player, a better captain, better, um, a better, better person? Better person, for sure. Better person, for sure. In what way? I just think, like, at the end of the day, football, fundamentally, is like, is such a high-pressure, high-stakes environment. If you take yourself out of that and have to deal with, say he was walking down the street, Someone was up to you. I hope you die of cancer. What? Like it? It just it's unthinkable, isn't it? Unthinkable. Yeah. And you wouldn't you wouldn't be surprised if that person turned around to you and smacked you. You like you're well within your rights. Like if you if you're walking with with your kids, I oh, hope you and your kid die. Like it's 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 honestly to, so to say that to any human being is unthinkable. But if you put that situation into football. Is somehow acceptable. So to be a person that can deal with that type of nonsense outside of football, inside of football, I just think helps you grow. Hundred percent. What is the who is the best player that you've played with? Jack Grealish. For what reason? Can't tackle him. Oh, you just can't tackle him. So frustrating playing against him as well. He um. I think he, most fouls against him in the Premier League, like, he just dribbles and dribbles. And then as soon as someone goes to tackle him, the ball's just gone. Like, he always leaves it the smallest amount of margin away from you. And, like, you think, I can get that. 
But it, draw, it just draws you in every time. I'll tell you another one as well. Ruben lost his cheek. Yeah. He started playing well, though, for Chelsea. We yeah. said no, they just lost the manager. But he, played, he has started playing well. But he's played in the deeper role, and I don't quite get that, because he's, like, he's a monster. Like, he's so powerful, so technically gifted. I just don't think he's quite hit the heights that he should, in my opinion. But I know that you must have played with him in under-21 setup, so Absolutely. it's difficult to be around them on a daily uh, sort of normal training ground environment. But what, what is it, do you think? Like, because Grealish gets... You know, he enjoys his summer. So, he, he, you know, he's, so people are pointing fingers at him. Is, is he this? Is he that? Or is he taking it serious enough? Or all this all, all this. See, stuff. that's so that's that's another point. So it's even started leaking into the lad's downtime. Yeah. So you're, instead of being a footballer for 10 months and then enjoying your time with your friends and family for a month, month and a half, you can't even do that now. So the the high pressure, high stakes world that we're living in is now includes your holiday. Oh, Jack Grealish, you can't be going to Vegas and partying. Why not? What? Why not? He gives everything he can for his club and country all year round. Why can't he have a blowout? And what was he like day to day in that England setup? Because that, this is the reason why I'm talking about people's opinions of him, is that I can imagine he's, you know, he's the most expensive English player ever. He's, yeah. I can imagine he's grafting his nuts off every day. Every day. Trains well, plays well. He's a top, top lad, like top lad. And it just like, it just baffles you that people draw. Don't get me wrong, he likes a night out. Like, but that is part of his personality. That's who he is. You see him on stage when Man City win the Prem with his beard, like all songing and dancing. And people saying, oh, can't act like that. Why not? It's every young lad's dream to win the Prem. He's just won it. Let him enjoy himself. It just, it, it honestly just makes no sense to me. I'd be even worse. If I won the Prem, I'd be worse than that. I'd just be laid out on the stage somewhere. <laughs> the uh, next one, mate, is the most important attribute, in your opinion, that players need to have if they're going to make a career out of the game? Consistency. I just think in everything you do, training, playing, living, food, sleep, everything, consistency is, is key. It seems off the back of this conversation as well that when you've, excelled your best that's that's been one of the main the main features of what you've been doing at the time yeah I think so yeah I think the focus that you have on football obviously day to day life is is going on around you there's there's all sorts happening in in your life and and you might be having problems with family da, da, da. but for that three four hours that you're in the building you're training for two of them you've got your gym you've got everything to do do everything best you can Recover, sleep well, eat well, and then just all the other stuff, take care of it outside. But for that block where you're working, you have to be you have to be consistent. And finally, mate, what advice would you give a young Matt Grimes just starting out his career? Um, don't ever think you've cracked it. I feel like when I went League Two to Prem, it it took a while for me to bed in. But then when I've gone from Prem to Championship or Prem to League One, well, mainly the Prem to Championship one with Leeds. I thought, like, oh, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm it's like it's a Championship. I'm going to play. The Championship is such a tough league, such a tough league, and there's always someone waiting to take your shirt if you if you let them in the, uh, the side door. And obviously, learn that the hard way. Um, but yeah, just don't don't ever think that you've made it. Even now, even now, I I still to this day. Need to stay in the team. Need to stay in the team. Because if you don't perform well, the the way football set up, especially in the higher clubs, oh, 50 million, there you go, for a, for a player to come in, replace you. I think sometimes the perception of players is that, you know, I have touched on it, but the perception of players sometimes, especially a, a captain of Swansea who, who plays every week and, and is performing very well recently, that everything's always been perfect and, and you know, there's no speed bumps, everything... There's no negative feeling that you've been through, but I think this conversation, hopefully people listening will be able to take it an enormous amount from it because, you know, you are you are human. You you know, you, you do feel negative things. And as you said from the very start, there's probably more negative feelings in football than there is positive. Mm. So for sharing that with us, mate, you know, I really appreciate it. And no, it's all got, it's all. you know, an incredible insight into your career and all, all the best for, for what comes from now. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it, mate. Cheers, mate. <laughs>